Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, we still have a couple people signing on, but I'm going to go ahead and do the intro and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Jessica Seward and I'm the Director of Customer Marketing here at Threat Connect. So I'm just going to take a couple minutes to go over a few housekeeping items and then I will introduce today's speaker. Um, so first, the webinar is being recorded. Um, so we will send that out today or tomorrow as soon as we get it posted to YouTube. So um, we will be sending that out. Um, second, everyone's phone line is muted. So if you have any questions, you can type them into the, the GoToWebinar console on your screen and we'll answer those at the end of the webinar. Um, so now I will introduce today's speaker, Richard Cody. Many of you probably worked with Richard. Um, he is a senior customer success engineer here at Threat Connect. And he has spent the last nine years working, the threat, working in the threat intelligence field. Before joining Threat Connect, Richard worked for the federal government tracking APT group activity. Richard enjoys the outdoors, road trips in his Jeep, and automating analytical tasks with Threat Connect's playbooks. So that's it for me. I am going to turn it over to Richard now. Awesome, thank you, Jessica. All right, let's get some slides. Uh, go. Can okay. you see my slides? Yes, we can. Awesome. Um, yeah, so hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining today. Um, yeah, as Jessica said, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Rich Cody. Uh, I've been with uh, with Threat Connect for uh, for just over three years now, uh, and uh, today we're going to be talking about components. And as you can see, uh, in addition to components, I also love like ten year old memes. So uh, there's that. Cool. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, so we're going to be covering a few things. Uh, so I'm going to be covering uh, what components are. Uh, we're going to talk about some some kind of benefits. Go through overview. Um, we're going to go through the anatomy of a component. Uh, we're going to discuss some use cases that make good components, uh, as well as uh, some use cases that uh, components and, and really playbooks in general are kind of not good for. Uh, you know, from there, we're going to I'll cover some some useful tools to help uh, component and, and playbook development. Uh, we'll talk about some kind of development methodologies. Uh, we'll go through some examples, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, Build one from scratch. So, you know, before we we really get into it, uh, I want to illustrate, you know, kind of where in the the playbooks hierarchy components, you know, fit, um, you know, and, and kind of who the the target audience is. Uh, so, you know, we find that the people who are kind of getting into into components are 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 kind of somewhere in the middle, right? Uh, they're not people that are completely brand new to orchestration. Um, and, and they tend not to, to be somebody who's like a full on, you know, uh, uh, app developer. Uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're kind of right there, you know, in, in the center. And then, you know, anybody who's ever sat in a meeting with me, you know, knows I, I say that Playbooks is kind of, you know, what I call the gateway drug to, to, to becoming a developer. Um, you know, Components kind of like iterates on that uh, kind of one step further, right? So it introduces a bit more of kind of the app development concepts um, but you, you, you're not necessarily, you know, writing code or anything like that. Uh, and so, you know, that is not to say that, you know, the material that we're going to be covering here today is is above or beneath anybody with a particular skill set. Uh, if you've written a playbook before, uh, then you're more than equipped to write a component. Uh, and and just because you may be a wizard at Python and you can kind of sling code with ease, uh, you know, doesn't mean that uh, that you're not going to find use in in building components for things. So, you know, let's talk about what a component is. Uh, and so, you know, the, the explain like I'm five, you know, concept is that, you know, it's really a, a playbook within a playbook. Uh, you know, that, however, it really only tells half the story. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it, it's meant for uh, repeat or for, for um, automating repeatable logic. Uh, so for anybody who is uh, familiar with coding concepts, think of them as you're, you're building functions. Uh, you know, one of the, the coolest uh, use cases for components is to is to build what you know basically amounts to kind of a, a quasi app. 
uh, which is really nice. You'll be able to define, you know, some input and some output logic and things like that. So I, you know, I can tell you that you know personally, I'm I'm trying to become kind of a you know a would-be Python developer. I'm definitely not there. Uh, so you know, it may take me you know quite some time to to kind of crank out a, an actual like playbook app. Um, but I can tell you that you know I can I can crank out a component in in no time. Um, so it really kind of lowers the the uh, the barrier to entry for for again, creating those kind of pseudo apps. Um, you know, with with much more ease. Uh, one thing to note, uh, you can see here on the right that I've got a couple of, uh, of, of screenshots here or, or uh, pictures of, uh, of some of the apps. So components are going to show up uh, as like an orange rectangle in a playbook instead of a blue one. Uh, so if you've you know messed with playbooks and, and drag and drop apps and things like that in there, um, if you see uh, that the the orange rectangle, that denotes that it is a component. Um, additionally, components do have kind of their own special little icon. Uh, and a section in like the playbook in the app list, um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, a couple of the, the benefits of using components. Uh, so one is, you know, you can standardize things again. Uh, you know, any repeatable logic, right? You can you can standardize that stuff. So as teams mature, uh, you know, you, you will be able to to leverage um, you know, components as they grow, right? Um, you can abstract complex logic into a much more easily digestible, uh, you know, view, right? Which is which is the component itself. Um, uh, one thing that's nice is that you know if you have a component that say five playbooks are are using, uh, and you need to change the logic of that component, uh, you know, you can do that once, and then every playbook is going to benefit from that change. So you don't have to go into each individual playbook and, and update. Uh, you know, said logic, right? So uh, you kind of have a bit of a, a force multiplier there. Uh, so you know, in in most use cases, it's it's recommended to utilize uh, components um, instead of having you know one playbook calling another playbook. Uh, so you know, before we had components, you could basically have you know, say one playbook using the HTTP client to to call another playbook to have that playbook execute some logic and maybe return uh, some information. Um, you know, the, the, one of the, the benefits of components is that, you know, if you use a playbook calling another playbook, it takes what we call two playbook workers out of, kind of out of commission while those, those complete, right? Um, you know, Threat Connect kind of has a, a certain number of playbook workers, meaning it can execute, you know, a number of playbooks concurrently. Um, so if you, instead of doing that, if you utilize a component, um, it only takes up one worker, right? It only takes up the worker for that master playbook and the component is being executed, you know, inside of that playbook. Uh, and again, once once we dive into this, uh, you know, it'll make a little bit more sense. But but just know that you know uh, there are a ton of technical benefits, and and you know one of the big ones is is uh, you know making sure you're you're um, getting the most out of the playbook workers that you're you're using. Uh, so here I wanted to just break down uh, you know the anatomy of a component. Um, as you can see, it's it, it, it's pretty simple, right? There's there's two real main things. Um, you know, I've got the component trigger in here and the component body. Uh, and although although I do reference the component body, um, you know, the really the net new functionality when when building a component itself is really centered around the trigger. Uh, you know, this is where you're going to define uh, data that gets uh, exposed into the component um, to be handled in the body. Um, and then this is also where you're going to uh, uh, write the the output variables. Uh, you know, where in some cases, if you want the component to produce some some information or some data that can be uh, worked with by other apps downstream, uh, this is where you're going to do it. Um, but you know, again, between the, the the input variables and the output variables, everything in between that, everything in the body is is just like writing a standard playbook. Uh, so you know, it's not you know this insurmountable you know new functionality that you have to learn. So, uh, you know, as previously mentioned, uh, you know, components are, are great when you have uh, a use case that you can kind of foresee repeating uh, in various situations and you don't want to have to kind of reinvent the wheel every single time, right? Um, you know, I've, I've got some, uh, some example use cases here that make uh, great components. Uh, you know, enrichment, always, always a good one. Um, you know, there's there's just a ton of, of great data sets out there that you may want to to you know get some knowledge from and bring that back into Threat Connect. Um, you know, so you can totally do that with with components. Uh, uh, you know, standardized alerting, 
uh, things like that, blocking with defensive solutions. Uh, you know, we have we have some basic malware analysis, uh, you know, functionality in Threat Connect. So you may want to, uh, you know, leverage components to do that uh, in a repeatable way. Um, the big thing is, you know, the last bullet point there is is really that, uh, you know, any third party API integration, um, you know, again, you can write apps for, but if you're not a coder, you can write a component for. Uh, and so we're going to be doing that uh, uh, in a little bit here. So, you know, one of the big things, again, is, is just kind of reiterating that, you know, uh, you know, if you have a repeatable use case that is, you know, three or more kind of steps or, or apps, um, you know, save yourself time and, and write a component. Uh, you know, it, it, I can promise you that uh, it, it really sucks having to kind of rewrite the same logic, uh, you know, if you're interacting with some, some API, right? Re rewriting that every single time you have a playbook that you want to have interact with that API, right? So save yourself the time, componentize the logic so you can just easily drop that, you know, into your playbook, uh, you know, irrespective of whatever workflow is happening there. So we talked about, uh, you know, times when you should be using a component, uh, but I do want to take a second and uh, talk about some times where you shouldn't be using a component uh, and, and really, maybe you shouldn't be using a playbook uh, in general. Um, so components and playbooks, uh, they do not handle bulk data ingest very gracefully. Uh, depending on how much data that you, you throw at it, uh, you can absolutely crash Direct Connect, um, you know, because just the way, you know, uh, playbooks are meant for more workflow. Um, and, and, you know, if you chuck, you know, 200,000 IOCs at a particular playbook and have and want the, the playbook to ingest them, uh, you will crash Direct Connect. Ask me how I know. Uh, components are, are, you know, they're not really a mechanism for doing any sort of big data analytics or manipulating very large data sets. Um, so, you know, there is a 500 meg limit as far as the amount of data that you can send between, between playbook apps themselves, uh, you know, so you know if you've got uh, you know if you've got a really large data set or maybe you want to do some you know some analytic on every IOC in Threat Connect, uh, you know there are better ways to do that. Uh, and finally, as, as kind of a best practice, uh, you know we don't recommend executing a playbook or a component you know on on every single IOC that comes into Threat Connect. Uh, you know so obviously there are, there are plenty of use cases. Uh, to uh, to perform against you know massive amounts of IOCs like things like enrichment scoring and stuff like that, uh, but there are better ways of doing that in Threat Connect. Uh, you know we have the concept of of runtime or what we call custom apps uh, that kind of run on a schedule. Um, you know those are, those are more likely going to be the solution that you want to turn to um, when handling really large data sets like that uh, because they're just much more streamlined for operations uh, such as that. Um, and especially, you know, when performance is more important than, than a quick solution. Uh, you know, if you wanted to, you know, prototype something in playbooks or a component, um, you know, that's, that's absolutely, you know, uh, a valid case. Um, but, you know, as far as a sustained production solution, uh, you know, components and playbooks just might not be the way to do that. Again, it's, they're, they're meant for more workflow type things, not, you know, uh, um, big data. Uh, you know, so that being said, uh, you know, you're not always going to know when something makes a good component or doesn't make a good component. Uh, well, you, let me rephrase that. You won't always know when something doesn't necessarily make a good component uh, until you go and you, you, you build it and then realize, oh, wow, okay, yeah, like we're expecting much more data than we originally thought. Uh, maybe we should look at turning this into some sort of an app. Um, you know, the key takeaway there is that, you know, playbook and component development, it's an iterative process. Uh, you know, so um, that will that will take time. Uh, and anybody who knows me, I'm a big nerd. I love Spider-Man. Uh, I love to tell everybody that with great power comes great responsibility. So again, um, be super careful uh, and don't bring down your production instance. Also, a good rule of thumb if you're developing playbooks and components, have a development instance. Uh, if you don't have one, talk to your your, your CSE um, or your CSM. Uh, you know, we can definitely hook you up with that. Uh, Developing in production, also not a good idea. Ask me how I know. Awesome. So, you know, we talked about what components are. Uh, we talked about what they aren't. Uh, you know, we've covered some of the pitfalls and possibilities. 
Um, you know, now we're going to get uh, you know more into the development process. Um, and and before we do that, uh, you know, for any task, we're going to need the right tools, right? Uh, you know, more often than not, when I'm writing a component, um, you know, especially when working uh, with a third-party API, I have three to four, uh, you know, tools in front of me. So, you know, one, you're going to need some good data parsing tools. Uh, you know, depending on what data format, if you're working with a third-party API, uh, depending on the data format that that API responds with, uh, is going to determine what, you know, what data parsing tool, what data parsing mechanism you're going to be using. Uh, nine times out of ten, it's going to be JSON, but occasionally you're going to get XML. Um, there are ways to convert that into JSON in playbooks. Wink, wink. Um, I am a JSON fanboy, not XML. Um, so today we're actually going to be using JMS Path or JMES Path. Uh, if anybody hasn't heard of it, it's basically JSON Path kind of cranked up to 11. Uh, it's really, really, really powerful, um, and, and we'll, we'll be using that a little bit later on today. Uh, additionally, uh, you know, it's always good to have a good regular expression builder and tester. Uh, you know, if you're building, you know, regular expressions, then then definitely, uh, you know, having that is 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 going to be key. Um, you know, one thing to note is that Threat Connect supports Java regex, uh, and so the only uh, tester that we've seen out there that that does have a 100% kind of two spec Java uh, Java regex engine in it is regexplanet.com. Um, I also use RegX 101. They've got something that's close, uh, and their interface is really awesome for for testing. It gives you great feedback on on you know what parts of your regular expression may not be hitting properly. Um, but you know I, I may build it in RegX 101, but I will always validate and test it in RegX Planet. Uh, you're also going to need a good uh, REST client or API tester. Uh, you know, again, especially if you're working with an API, you have to test that. Um, so if you're a Mac user, there's Paw, um, which has some pretty cool uh, features and some functionality in there, especially when it comes to uh, building like complex authentication schemes and, and stuff like that. Um, I actually prefer Postman. Um, I did start off with Paw, uh, and and I I, uh, I kind of joined the dark side or or the light, whichever way you see it. Um, Postman is pretty awesome. Uh, there is a desktop client, uh, and there's also a, a deprecated Chrome extension. I don't think they make any updates to it, uh, but it is still available. Um, and depending on uh, you know the the use case, um, you know you may need to to jump into the Chrome extension if you're maybe proxy or uh, in a VPN or something like that. Uh, and then of course you're going to need Threat Connect to build a component. Um, you know that being said, components and and playbooks in general are are basically just glorified JSON files. Um, so, you know, if there's anybody out there that is able to freehand a component using a text editor, um, I personally promise I will upload a video of me singing karaoke to whatever your favorite song is. Uh, so the gauntlet has been laid down, but again, have to build it from scratch. Um, and I did forget to put this uh, in the slide, but uh, for everybody's sake, do not try and build an integration with any sort of a third party API without the API docs. Um, if you do, you're going to have a bad time. All right, so uh, with that, we are going to go ahead and jump into some example components, uh, and then we're going to build one from scratch. So let's see here. I should be able to. All right. So for that, uh, let me go ahead and log in to Thread Connect here. Let me zoom in just a wee bit here so everybody can see. All right. Uh, so for today's example component, uh, we're going to be leveraging passive total, uh, and we are going to uh, we're going to be building uh, a component to work with their uh, to to basically pull uh, SSL certificate history for a uh, for an, uh, an IP address. So um, you know, first things first. Uh, whenever I'm, I'm, you know, looking to build a component, again, especially with with uh, any sort of a third-party API, uh, you always want to see, okay, well, you know, what's what's the authentication scheme? So let me scroll all the way up here to the top. Uh, quick start. Here we are. Um, you know, first and foremost uh, is is figuring out how am I going to authenticate to this thing. Uh, so from the looks of it, uh, they use basic auth, which is pretty common. Um, so we, we'll be able to support that pretty easily here. 
All right, so I'm gonna jump over into Threat Connect here. And uh, actually, before we before we jump into to building the uh, the passive total component, let's just take a look at a couple examples that we have here. Uh, so these were written by, I believe, Ryan Fortress, who's uh, one of our, our uh, security architects. Uh, he's, he's really awesome and, and loves building stuff. Um, but I just wanted to show you here that, so we have this, this guy right here is, is a pretty nifty one. Uh, so anybody who's ever worked with a playbook where you've had to parse indicators out of, uh, you know, text or things like that um, with, uh, with a regular expression, um, you know, we do have our, our, uh, our regular expression app uh, where you can kind of build your own custom ones and throw them in there. Um, you know, it, it doesn't come with any regex is already kind of preloaded. Uh, you have to basically, if you, you know, want to pull IPv4s out, you have to basically build the regular expression, copy and paste it, and throw it in there. Uh, and, and so Fortress realized, hey, you know, more often than not, um, I'm, I'm wanting to parse all of the indicator types at the same time. So he built a component here. So we can see we've got the component trigger, and if I go ahead and double click on this and jump into it, uh, you can see here that, uh, and again, when we build the component, our component from scratch, we'll go more in depth in here, but he's just passing some, some trigger data, which is some string data, uh, into the component. And then you can see here that he's got all of the regular expressions for the different indicator types already pre-built here. So basically now what he could do, or, or what anybody could do, is essentially take this component and just drag this, or you know, just drop it into any playbook that they want, and just send some data to it, and it's automatically going to give you, you know, it's going to parse all the indicator types out instead of having to go in there and you know say, okay, well here's the here's the the string data, I want to you know copy and paste the host reject into it and things like that, right? So it's it's you know it's going to save you a couple minutes each time you're doing it. Um, which is this is actually a really really uh, a great example of of a component use case that's not necessarily um, uh, you know working with an, a separate API or something like that. Uh, and then the last one here that we're going to show you a good example of is uh, so this is uh, this is to work with CrowdStrike Falcon Hosts uh, API, uh, but more specifically, uh, it's to to get the the token right. So um, building authentication schemes. Uh, is definitely um, you know a great use case for this. Uh, you know, so if you have some you know API endpoint that maybe we don't have an app for yet, obviously again you're going to have to authenticate to that. Um, and if it's something that's more than basic off, uh, you know, then you're going to have to do you know something like like this, which is you know again. Uh, so looking at the component trigger, uh, it looks like actually he doesn't have any any input data. So literally just uh, you know reaches out to their their API uh, sends probably sends user creds um, then that's their API is going to return with a, a, a token and that token can then be exposed uh, as an output trigger or an output variable here uh, to be used um, you know downstream with with any other apps that you want so awesome uh, so with that so let's go ahead and jump in and create our component so we'll go here and we'll click on new and we're gonna create a playbook. And it's gonna ask you, hey, do you wanna create a playbook or do you wanna create a component? Uh, so we're gonna do a component and I'm gonna call this, uh, let's see here. So we will say uh, get passive total SSL certificate history. Uh, and the description, uh, you know, again, good rule of thumb, you know, comment your code, document your, your, your components and your playbooks. Um, so that way, you know, if, if somebody else wants to use this, uh, they don't have to go through every single app and figure out what is this thing actually doing. Um, this component will, uh, let's see. Uh, total uh, query. Uh, history of a given IP address. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and save. Let's zoom out just a wee bit here. All right, so we automatically give you the component trigger, um, which you know this is every component has to have a component trigger. So, uh, and then you can see here over on the left, I mean, you've got access to all of the playbook apps, you know, uh, that you would normally use in a playbook. So um, again, it, if you've built a playbook before, you can build a component. So uh, what we're going to be using here, so we have uh, we have 
our, our playbook GUI here. Um, I have their API docs. And so uh, from there, basically, uh, and then we've got some, we're gonna do some parsing of, of some stuff later. Um, but let me go ahead and open up the component trigger here. And we're gonna define our, our, our input variables first, right? So uh, looking at this, I need to supply a username and a password uh, for to authentic, or a username and a, a secret key, I'm sorry, um, to, to interact with their API. So I'm gonna go ahead and define those, right? So the first one, I'm gonna call this, uh, so I'm just copying and pasting from a separate document here so I don't mess it up. Uh, I'm gonna say, all right, I need to define an API user, and this is gonna be the uh, passive total API user. user. All right, so here I can basically say, what do I want this to, to look like, right? Is this gonna be a text field? Is it gonna be a drop down? Uh, a checkbox, things like that, right? Uh, so we're gonna stick with the text field. And I can say that this field accepts string data or string array or binary data. Um, so I'm gonna stick with string. And I'm gonna say that this is absolutely required, uh, you know, to, to, to use this component, I'm gonna make somebody supply uh, their credentials. Um, and I'm going to allow text variables and I will uncheck allow keychain variables. And so what this is, is you, you know, you can do uh, basically what we call org level variables. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna uh, you, uh, allow the user to, to use that. And you'll see uh, in just a little bit um, what that looks like. So we've got that. We're also gonna need to supply the secret key that passive total gives you. Uh, and so same thing, passive total API secret. Awesome. Uh, again, text field, accept string. Uh, it is required. And for the secret key, uh, I am gonna, uh, it's gonna be encrypted and I'm gonna allow keychain variables. So to make sure those credentials uh, you know, stay masked. All right, so we're supplying our username and our secret key to, uh, to interact with the API. And then if I go back in here and I look at the certificate history. So uh, it is going to ex expect uh, either a SHA-1 hash or an IP address to retrieve the certificate history. So being this component, we're gonna basically pass it uh, an IP and then pull the certificate history. Um, I am going to, uh, to, to, to work with that, right? Uh, so you can see here, their API docs will tell us that, hey, this is the URL that you're gonna need to hit. Uh, and here's, what, here's the body of, of what your request needs to look like, right? Or it's gonna be form data. Uh, so, this is the last, basically the last field or parameter that I need to, to supply, right? So what I'm gonna do is go back into my component here and I'm gonna say, all right, the last bit of information that the user needs to supply is, is the query address, right? And so address to uh, search history, all right. And this is gonna be required, and I'm not gonna allow any, any of the org level variables. Uh, uh, these variables are different from, from output variables in playbooks, um, but, and you'll still see that in a little bit. Uh, and uh, being that uh, their API looks like you can only query uh, one at a time, it's, you may be able to query more, but for now we're gonna just do uh, querying one, so we'll only allow for a string. All right, so we've got our our three uh, we've got our three input variables uh, uh, defined. All right, so now that we've got that, let's actually do a quick test, uh, and I'm going to share Postman here. So this is Postman again. If anybody's ever ever seen this before, um, so I've already got the the query mocked up here. Um, so we're gonna do a get request. I've got my IP address here that I wanna test with. Uh, again, this is where you know, you'll know you wanna test your, your API calls in this uh, before um, you know, building that in the playbook just to make sure that, that it, it works properly. So we've got that, I've got the URL, I've got the uh, IP address, authorization, uh, I've got, uh, we're using basic auth, but I've actually got the, author, uh, the API credentials already hard coded in here. So basically all we need to do is just do a test. All right, so we'll send this here. All right, so it worked, right? We got our 200 okay. 
Uh, and you can see that we've got the response body here. So what I'm gonna do now is take this JSON. All right, so actually first things first, before we start parsing stuff, uh, we know that this works. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy, uh, copy this URL and we're gonna jump back into our playbook. And we're going to get that API call set up. So we're going to use our HTTP client. Uh, this is like the Swiss Army knife of working. You know, it's probably yeah the Swiss Army knife app of playbooks here. Whenever you need to work with, uh, you know, any sort of using webhooks or or uh, you know again doing get request post things like that, um, you're going to want to use the HTTP client. So um, always. Do a good job and name your apps. So we'll say get SSL certificate history. Uh, the URL, we've got that here, right? So we have our API URL. <clears throat> we're gonna be doing a get request. Uh, and then you can see here that we're gonna need to basically mock up the, the parameters uh, that we need to send, right? So we need to send our credentials and then obviously the IP address that we wanna query for. So I know that for, uh, for the query parameters, it requires us to send the query, which is here. And then that query parameter is going to be our query.address. So we've got that. And now I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to actually, let me just zoom out just a little bit more. Uh, I'm gonna pop open the display notes because we have uh, some pretty cool new features with our newest version of our, our HTTP client. Uh, where we don't have to build the like the authorization header, you know, manually and all that stuff. We don't have to build it in here. We can actually in the advanced settings portion just define a username and a password, and and that's going to handle all the auth for us. So we'll do username, and that is going to be. Oops, uh, let's go down here. We want our API user, and then password. It's going to be our API secret. So done. It's handled. All that stuff is going to be handled. So we'll go ahead and hit save. So we should. We've got that already mocked up. Uh, we've we've tested it with Postman. So we go back here and we've got our 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 JSON response right. So let's go ahead and copy this. And then we're going to go to the kind of third and final tool that we're going to be using here. And this is JMES Path. So uh, if you go to jmespath.org, it's that's their online website. Um, you know, it's got a tester in there. It, it goes, you know, has the tutorial and on all the specifications and all that. Um, as I said, it's really awesome. Think of it as like a JSON par parser that's got like some cool programming function uh, functionality in it and things like that. Uh, you could do some slicing and and um, you know you can even kind of do some if statements in there and things like that. So um, but what we're going to do is we're going to do some really, really basic um, parsing of this data, right? Uh, so uh, what we want to do is we want to pull out the – we're going to just pull out the, the SHA-1 hashes of all of the certificates. Uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to pull out the IP addresses, uh, but we're going to pull the last scene and the first scene information and all the SHA-1s, right? So we're going to get an array of dates. Uh, and, and SHA-1 hashes for all the certificates that have been seen on this IP address. So uh, this is pretty cool. If we just do results, and then I need to, because it's an array, I need to hand that and then do SHA-1. This is gonna give us, and this is really nifty, this is actually the offline version of it. Um, I recommend if you're dealing with sensitive data, um, download and run the offline version of it so you're not just pasting all of your JSON data into some random website. Um, but you can see here that basically I'm saying in all the results, give me the SHA ones. Uh, and so you can see that it returns all this stuff here. So we're going to go ahead and save that. And then I'm going to pop over here and go to app. And then we have our JMS Path app. Uh, this is like, I think this was just like a brainchild of one of our developers that like fell in love with JMS Path and decided to write an app. Uh, and it like changed my life. So. Let's pop this open. So it's gonna say, hey, so again, first things first, uh, let's just say parse SSL certificate history. 
again, name your apps, folks. Um, you know, nothing pains me more than opening up a playbook with, you know, 50 apps and it just says like JMS path one, JMS path two, HTTP client one, HTTP client two. So, uh, you know, and it's gonna pain you later on when you have to go back and debug something, uh, a playbook that you wrote three months ago. Um, so it's gonna say, hey, what, what's the JSON data? What's the JSON that we're, the, what's the data that we're working with? Well, we're gonna be getting our JSON data as the content, the response content from our HTTP client here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do this here, type content, and you can see here that uh, it's, it's gonna uh, reference the content from our previous app. So here, uh, what's pretty nifty is that you can define JMS path uh, parsing expressions. Again, that expression, oops, uh, that expression is this, this piece here. Uh, you can define it as either I'm expecting to only get a string returned from this or I'm gonna get an array, right, multiple values. Uh, I know from looking at this that I've got an array of stuff here. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this expression and I'm gonna paste it in the value of in string array here. And then the key, so basically this is saying what's the name of this array that you want, uh, that you want to be exposed uh, as an output variable, right? And so what I'm gonna do is, we have a good naming convention here. Uh, so I'm going to call this, I'm just trying to copy it here. So it is uh, PT, so passive total dot certificate dot history dot SHA1. And then I'm gonna just add that, right? And so I'm gonna do the same thing real quick uh, instead of, uh, Actually, I can, since it's pretty easy. Uh, I know that the SHA-1 is on the same level in the JSON as the last scene and the first scene, so I should be able to just say last scene, and that's gonna give me all of these dates, so I can copy that, paste that in here, and then I'll just copy this and say dot last scene. And then I'm gonna do the same thing, oops, uh, right, dot first scene. Because I know that that the the uh, actual expressions, the JMS path expressions, are are pretty much the same. Awesome. So we're pretty much done here, right? So go ahead and hit save, and now you can see that I've got my output variables here. I've got an array of SHA ones. I've got an array of last seen dates and an array of first seen dates. So the last thing that we need to do for this component is because right now these aren't going anywhere, right? But I, remember, this is a playbook inside of a playbook. I need to expose all of this information here outside of the component so that when we build a playbook that uses it, uh, we'll be able to get that information out, right? So what I'm gonna do is take this and just send it right back into the trigger here. And then I'm gonna open this trigger back up, and then you can see that we already did the, the inputs, but if I hit next, this is where we're gonna define the outputs. And so what, I, what I'm gonna do here uh, is because I like the naming convention where I've got PT, certificate history, all that stuff, it tells you, you know, what what it is that this information, you know, what, what's in this this variable. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, and just use, re, essentially reuse those, right? So uh, PT.certificate, and then uh, let me just copy this real quick. I'm just gonna reuse these names as the actual um, keys here, right? And then we'll do this guy. So this is gonna be the first scene. We'll add that. And then I'll do last scene. Awesome. And then one more thing. Um, again, good rule of thumb. Uh, whenever you uh, make a, a, an API call or something like that, um, always, you know, that JSON data, that raw JSON, expose that outside of the variable because you never know when somebody using your component may wanna do something else with that JSON data. Um, so in addition to parsing everything out and exposing that as output variables, um, I will actually just expose the, the raw JSON as well. Uh, and I'll call this pt.response.result, um, which is, it, it's, it follows the naming convention that we have for things like our virus total app and things like that. Uh, and again, it's it's going to be that 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 content, right? That that string content. 
So again, if, if somebody just so happens to, to want to see the raw a or the raw JSON or, or, or something like that, um, you know, be a good developer, just uh, just expose that out there for them. So we should be good to go, right? So we've got our component trigger, let's just double check. We've got all of our inputs. Awesome, we've got our outputs. Uh, we're getting the information, we're parsing it. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and activate this playbook. Awesome. Actually, before I do that, one last thing. Um, this is a cool, some cool functionality here. We have the concept of labels. Um, I'm going to add a couple of labels in here. So SSL certificate is one that I'm gonna add. Think of these as tags on your playbooks or your components. Um, so if I, you know, I'm gonna add pass total and SSL certificate. So um, now that that's done, I'll show you kind of how that comes into play. I'll activate this playbook. And we're gonna jump back into the playbooks menu. This, this is where that you know, kind of playbook exception comes into play. We've got our component here, you can see, and this is that little icon for our component, and we can see that we've got the green check mark, right? It's enabled. So now we're gonna create a quick little playbook. Um, I'll just call this pre-production, you know, pre um, you know, test uh, PT SSL search history, right? I'll just say playbook to test my new component. Awesome, and this one's gonna be a playbook. So I just wanna test and verify that this thing works the way I expect it to, right? Uh, so for that, uh, I'm gonna use the HTTP link trigger and just, I'm gonna use Postman, that, that uh, API tester that we, we, saw, we saw before. Uh, I'm just gonna use that to pass some data to this playbook and, and see what I get back, right? Um, so now if I go here to apps, you can see that we've got, under component, we've got our get passive total SSL certificate history. Look at that. So we'll go ahead and drag that in there. And if we open this up, it's gonna say, hey, just a heads up, you know, you're requiring some fields here. And now you can see that those input variables that we defined, the API user, the secret, and the IP address that we have to query. Um, so I'm going to, I, have, I already have my credentials saved as, as org level variables. Uh, and you remember that when I was defining those input variables, I allowed for those to be referenced. So we've got that, we've got our secret, and then it's gonna say, hey, where's what's the IP address that I wanna query? I could just hard code you know, 1.2.3.4 in there, or 1245, uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass this some data through the HTTP link trigger uh, in the body. So we get that. And now we can see that it's gonna give us all of this information, right? Um, just to kind of, uh, actually, well, it's not saving that much time. So it's gonna give us basically a bunch of arrays of SHA-1s and all that stuff here. Um, I know that when I wanna return that as a response to my, my get request, um, I'm gonna have to join all of those. So I'll just join them really quickly uh, because you can only pass string data um, in the in the body, right? So I'll just call this, um, so let's see, we're getting the SHA-1, so I'll call this join.SHA-1 here. I'm just basically pasting those uh, uh, that information in here. So uh, we want SHA-1, and then uh, let's do the first scene and the last scene, so Again, what I'm doing is I'm just referencing these arrays here and I'm turning them into strings. And then the last bit, we will do join dot. So I'm creating new variables here. And then we've got, I think that's our first scene. Cool, and then what's the join delimiter? Well, it's nine times out of 10 gonna be a comma. Uh, it may be pipes or something like that. Uh, and then, so we'll say join PT, uh, passive total, um, response arrays. So now you can see that I've got basically string versions of all that information that we're getting. And then I can pass that back to the trigger here as a response body. Um, one thing to note here, uh, so type, uh, and I think it's a plain text, I believe. Uh, and so 
the reason why we have to define the header now, Chrome used to basically kind of sort of try and figure out what the content type was, um, but now it doesn't. So we'll just download whatever response as a, a natural file. Um, I'm not in love with that. So uh, cool. So we're going to pass it an IP address and we're going to get the uh, SSL search SHA1 hashes. And then we've got our join SHA1. Uh, first scene dates, last scene dates. Awesome, so this is what the response is gonna look like. We go and hit save. I think we should be good to go here. Collapse that metadata. Look at that, it didn't scream at me that I'm missing some stuff. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna copy the URL here and then we're gonna jump back over into Postman. And you can see that I'm gonna post to that URL. Uh, and then in the body here, I've just got an IP address. So let's go ahead and hold on to your butts. Go and hit send. And just so you can see, hopefully I can do this before. We can hit here and we can see that, up. Oh, it actually already executed, right? And so, uh, you know, I don't need to do any debugging, but I can see each individual app. Obviously, this follows kind of the standard, um, you know, debugging process for playbooks. Uh, if there was, you know, something that went wrong, you could turn the playbook up to trace uh, and see what's being passed from app to app. But if I go in here and I look, now I can bring this up here, and you can see that I've got that list of SSL cert uh, SHA-1 hashes. I've got all the dates the first scene and the last scene, right? Uh, obviously, you know, this is just kind of doing some testing, but we can see that our component works, right? We were able to successfully pass in uh, some creds and an IP address. Uh, it, it now queried, um, you know, passive totals API and returned a bunch of information for us. Um, so now this, this component is ready to go. So if you wanted to maybe have a playbook that does you know this information or does this the you know this uh, workflow on like a timer or you want to ad hoc you know go to the details page of an ip address and threat connect and say hey you know let me let me get the ssl certs uh the sha1 hashes and, and you know things like that right so irrespective of whatever condition you want uh the playbook to kick off you've now got the ability to just just quickly define your credentials and the ip address and start querying third-party apis uh, and i didn't have to write any code uh, so, uh, that is all I've got for you. Um, Jessica, I don't know if we want to, uh, actually, let's see here, hold on. I think I've got a slide for this. There we go. Questions? Right. Thank you. Great info. Um, we had a couple people ask about the recording and we will be sending that out. Uh, probably tomorrow morning to everyone who registered. So that will be coming. Um, let's see, next question. Um, all right. Let's say I, ha I have built four components and have a playbook that utilizes all of them. When I want to move my playbook from my development instance to production, do I have to export all of the components one at a time? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, so the answer is uh, no, you don't have to uh, export all the components one at a time. Uh, all you have to do is export the playbook that uses those, uh, and it will bring those components over uh, as part of that. So you can just import you know, the, the playbook uh, into the new instance. It will say, hey, heads up, it's got you know, these four components in them, and they will be, um, they will be uh, uh, ingested or they will be uh, imported as part of this process. So uh, great question. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Next question. For format, this is about formatting the output in an attribute. How best to get new lines after a join of some sort? Oh, uh, great question. Yeah. Um, so you would want to use the find and replace uh, app. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, you're gonna have your, your join string 
um, with commas, and I would just say, um, you know, find commas and replace them with uh, with an actual new line character. So you can just throw the new line straight into the find replace app. Okay, great, thank you. And that looks like all the questions right now. Um, if you do think of any more, you can feel free to reach out to me, um, Jay Seward at Threat Connect, and I can route your questions in the right direction. Um, and again, we'll be sending this out for anyone who wants to review or watch it again. Thank you so much, Rich. This is great. Thanks, everybody.